Good morning. My book, How Children Succeed, was published in North America two years ago. But since then, it's been translated into 25 languages and published in countries around the world. And that has given me this remarkable opportunity to connect and communicate with readers from across the globe, teachers, parents, education officials. And what I've come to understand is that even though my reporting for the book all took place in the United States, the ideas that I wrote about transcend national borders. WISE, I feel, is a central venue for this new, dynamic, global conversation about the meaning and purpose of education. And it is a real honor for me to be able to be here today and to talk to you about some of these ideas. The idea at the center of my book is that the conventional wisdom that has governed our thinking about education for the past couple of decades has been misguided. We've been emphasizing the wrong skills and abilities in our children, and we've been using the wrong strategies to help develop those skills and abilities. The name that I give in the book to this conventional wisdom is the cognitive hypothesis. And what I mean by that is this idea that I think a lot of us share even if we're not always willing to admit it, that the one quality that matters most in a child's success is his or her IQ. That success is all about that narrow band of cognitive skills that get measured on standardized tests. I think this idea is behind our global obsession with test scores. But the educators and the scientists who I wrote about in How Children Succeed have identified a very different set of skills that they say matter at least as much as IQ and quite possibly more so. The list includes persistence, creativity, curiosity, conscientiousness, self-control, optimism. If you talk to an economist, they'll tell you this is a list of non-cognitive skills. That's their term for these skills. Psychologists often use the phrase personality traits, neuroscientists talk about executive functions, and educators, and I think a lot of the rest of us, think of these as character strengths, or just character. And what the research suggests is that if we want to intervene to help children develop these skills, there are two particular times in a child's life that are especially fruitful to intervene. One is in early childhood when the brain, as we know, is so malleable, so plastic. And the other is in adolescence. And that's because of a phenomenon that psychologists call metacognition. And metacognition just means thinking about thinking. And it is in adolescence when, for the first time, young people are able to really reflect on their own thought processes, on their own behaviors, where they're able to really think deeply about themselves. And if you've hung out with teenagers recently, you might have noticed they like thinking deeply about themselves a lot. So one of the things that these interventions do is to try to take advantage of that natural tendency to help these young people change their habits and change their patterns and really change their character. One of the places where I saw this in action in my reporting was in two schools in New York City that are trying this new experimental collaboration around character education. One school is, the, is KIPP Infinity, uh, a middle school, meaning that it serves children between 11 and 14 years old. Uh, a middle school in Harlem, in New York, that serves a mostly low-income student population. The other school was the Riverdale Country School, one of the most exclusive and expensive private schools in New York. So these are obviously two very different schools serving very different student populations. And yet a few years ago, the two educators who ran these two schools found themselves in a similar position. On paper, both of their schools were doing just great. The kids at KIPP were all getting fantastic standardized test scores. The kids at Riverdale were all getting into the best colleges. And yet both Dave Levin, the head of the KIPP schools in New York, and Dominic Randolph, the head of the Riverdale School, felt like there was something missing in the education that they were giving to their students. They felt like they were producing graduates who were great test takers, great at applying to college, but who were lacking the inner strength, the grit or resilience or self-discipline to deal with real challenges in life. 
And so these graduates would often get out there into the real world, whether that meant high school or college or beyond. And they would meet with some setback, as we all eventually do. And they would often get completely derailed. And so both Dave and Dominic decided that if they wanted to help their students succeed, not just on next week's test, but in the long term and in a deep way, they had to find some way to address their character. So they decided to work together. They started working with a team of uh, researchers in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And working with them using statistics and surveys, they eventually came up with a list of seven character strengths that they've decided are the most important, the most predictive of long-term success. Here's their list. Curiosity, gratitude, zest, optimism, self-control, social intelligence, and grit. And it's grit, I think, that tends to get people's attention more than any other. It's a word with a long history, but as a psychological category, it's a pretty new invention. And it's the invention of this one researcher, uh, a young woman at um, Penn named Angela Duckworth. And Angela defines grit as passion and perseverance for long-term goals. In school, the students who have grit are the ones who embrace a goal and stick with it tenaciously, sometimes for years, ignoring all obstacles and distractions. And at KIPP, they've taken these seven character strengths, grit and zest and curiosity and all the rest, and they've turned them into an actual character report card. So four times a year, each student at KIPP Infinity is assessed on all seven of these character strengths by each of his or her teachers. In order to understand the thinking behind the character report card, I think it's useful to know about the work of a psychologist at Stanford University named Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck is famous for her work on what she calls mindset. One of her great discoveries is that one of the best predictors of which children will succeed and which ones will not turns out to be their opinion about this question of the malleability, the changeability of our intelligence. And she uses that question to divide all of us into those, of us, those who have a fixed mindset, who think that our intelligence can't ever really change, that it's just something you're born with or you're not. And those who have a growth mindset, who believe that our intelligence can change, that we can grow it and improve it with practice. And what she finds is that young people who have a growth mindset behave very differently. They work harder, they try more, they deal much better with failure. And what KIPP is doing with its character report card is trying to transplant this growth mindset idea from intelligence to character. They're sending their students the message that even in these qualities that to so many of us can seem innate, it's just something you're born with or not, like your curiosity or your self-control, that in fact these are skills that we can all learn, that we can improve, that we can actually practice. Now I said that Kip and Riverdale had worked together to come up with this list of seven character strengths and that at Kip they've turned them into a character report card. But at Riverdale, the private school, they are not doing a character report card. And when I asked Dominic Randolph, the head of the school, why that was, he explained that at a, at a school like his, which is a typical New York City private school, highly competitive, high stress, at a school like his, if he introduced something called a report card for things like curiosity and zest, all of the parents would be hiring tutors to help their students pass the curiosity and zest tests. And that was, really, that was really the opposite of what Dominic wanted for his students. Dominic was a fascinating character to me. As I said, on paper, his school was doing just great. But he was deeply concerned that his students, who were mostly from affluent families, were missing out on these important opportunities to develop these crucial character strengths because they were so protected from real challenge, protected by their families, protected by their school, protected by their whole culture. They and the adults around them were so focused on their achievement that there was no room in their lives for failure. And Dominic thought this was a great mistake. The way he put it to me is that character strengths like grit and self-control are born out of failure. 
And in most high-achieving academic environments, no one really fails anything these days. I think one of the most important things that teachers can do each day in the classroom to help their students is to help them learn how to manage failure, how to put their failures into the right context, how to see them as necessary temporary steps on the path to success. The place in my reporting where I saw this in action most vividly was actually over a chessboard. I reported in my book on the most successful middle school chess team in the United States. Again, students between about age 11 and age 14. They came from a public school in a low-income neighborhood in Brooklyn, New York, not the traditional demographic for chess success in the United States. And yet they were the best chess team in their age group in the country. And I wanted to try to understand the secret of their success. And I eventually came to believe that it all had to do with the teaching style, the teaching strategy of their chess coach, this teacher named Elizabeth Spiegel. And I think what she was doing for them more than anything was helping them learn how to manage failure. One of the things I didn't realize about chess until I started my reporting is that when you play chess, you fail all the time. No matter how good you are, you're still going to lose about half your games. And even when you win, you make dozens of stupid mistakes every game. And if you're 11 or 12 and you're faced with this kind of constant daily failure, there are two real temptations. One is to just laugh it off and say, ah, chess, it's a stupid game, I wasn't trying anyway. The other is to wallow in the shame of your loss and convince yourself you're the worst chess player ever, you'll never get any better. And what Elizabeth was able to do was to guide her students between these two temptations. And she did it by getting them to look really honestly and straightforwardly at their own mistakes, at their own failures. There's this ritual that every student on the chess team is intimately familiar with, which is that after every game at a tournament, whether you win or lose, you then have to sit down with Ms. Spiegel and replay the whole game with her, move by move, while you talk about all the mistakes that you made. I sat in on a lot of these sessions, and I have to say they could be a little bit grueling. I somehow had this idea that she was going to be saying things like, ah, it's okay, it's just a game, you tried your best, we had fun, that's what's important, right? But it wasn't like that at all. She could be a little bit harsh, a little bit tough. She would say things like, a rook, what were you thinking? Did you even look at the board? And yet the kids loved it. They, they understood that she cared very deeply about them and how they were doing. She wasn't belittling them, she wasn't tearing them down. She had high expectations for them. She wasn't going to hold their hand and make the moves for them on the chessboard, but instead she was going to give them the knowledge and the skill and the confidence that they needed to go out and win their next game. And very often, that's exactly what they did. And what I think in the process that she was doing was not just giving them this important chess knowledge, but also helping them learn how to manage failure. But it's not enough, I don't think, for teachers to simply be tough and demanding. Those demands need to come with support and encouragement. One of the most important studies that I've encountered in the two years since my book was published was done by a psychologist at the University of, the University of Texas named David Yeager. The challenge that he wanted to take on was that students in, in struggling neighborhoods, especially low-income neighborhoods, they often at a certain point have a hard time receiving feedback from their teachers because they simply stop trusting them. When their teachers give them criticism, negative feedback, they take that as a sign that their teachers don't think they're smart, don't think that they can succeed. And when their teachers go the other way and give them positive feedback and praise for mediocre work, they take that as a sign that their teachers don't think that they can achieve at a high level. And so David Yeager wanted to try to get through, to cut through this trap. And so he designed this experiment. He took a classroom of underachieving 12-year-olds. Their assignment that week was to write an essay about their heroes. And so each teacher uh, graded these papers the way they usually would. They marked all the mistakes. They made suggestions for revisions. And then on half of the papers, David Yeager put a, a post-it note, a sticky note, a note from the teacher that simply had one sentence on it. I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and I know that you can reach them. 
one sentence, shouldn't make a big difference, right? And yet, it did. The students who had the post-it note on their paper were much more likely to revise their papers. When they revised them, they were much more likely to improve them. In fact, those students did better in that class throughout the whole school year. I think the moral of this experiment is that students want honest feedback and high standards, but they also want to believe, they need to believe, that their teachers believe in them and believe that they can improve. And to be honest, I think that students don't get that feeling very often in the classroom. One interesting fact that I've found is that if you, if you talk to adults and you ask them to think back on their own school days and think about who it was in school who helped them the most in this non-cognitive or character dimension, it's rare that people will identify an academic teacher. They're more often likely to cite a coach, an athletic coach, or a drama coach, an art teacher, or a music teacher. And I think the reason for that is that good coaches are experts at helping students deal with and manage failure. You can't learn to play a piece of music or to shoot a free throw in basketball without failing at that task hundreds and hundreds of times. And if you have the right kind of coach next to you helping you through that process, it can be a transformative experience. You learn how to put those failures in the right context. You learn a growth mindset. Now, I think that doesn't happen very often these days in math class or history class, but I think that it can. One of the places I've been reporting recently is on a, a group of schools called Expeditionary Learning Schools. And what I like about their approach is that they, take, uh, they use project-based learning, very long-term projects. So instead of students skipping around from one worksheet and one assignment and one subject to another, they take on one big project that can last months, even as long as the whole school year. And they constantly revise this project. They get critiques from their fellow students and from their teachers, and they revise them again and again. And what I think they're learning is not only the skill and the subject that they're focused on, the ostensible point of the assignment, but also they're learning that they have the ability to improve, the ability to bounce back from failures, the ability to persevere. One last study I want to talk about. I talked earlier about this idea of grit, passion and perseverance for long-term goals. There was recently an interesting study on the relationship between grit and creativity, the subject of this summit. A researcher at Yale University completed a study, who found, and she found that grit actually doesn't correlate all that well with the brainstorming side of creativity. The students who were able to come up with dozens of great, crazy, brilliant, creative ideas in class were not necessarily the ones who had a lot of grit. But what she did find was that grit was related to students' ability to complete those creative projects. I think when we talk about making our schools more creative, that can often get interpreted to mean simply giving students more freedom. But any successful creative person will tell you that creativity has two sides to it. First, you have to be able to free your mind to go off in all sorts of unusual, innovative directions. But then you have to be able to train your mind to turn those brainstorms into productive work, a novel, or a symphony, or a computer program, or a national constitution. And that work often takes years to complete, years of critique and revision, years of countless failures and even more successes. Helping our students learn to develop both sides of that creativity equation, I think that is the most important gift that we can give them. And it comes from the right kind of support, the right kind of feedback, being warm and supportive and encouraging, and yet honest and critical and demanding all at the same time. Thank you very much.